This is uh, lecture 2, UGIS and Wildlife Science and uh, let's have a quick recap what we covered in lecture 1 uh, to start with. Um, in lecture 1, a uh, gentle introduction to QGIS. As you remember, uh, we, um, we worked in quick, ma quick maps that are in Google map and we did raised to map, you know, we loaded raised to map and then we loaded a vector shape file in polygon map which is also called polygon map and then we did Google map and coordinates, you know, uh, we looked at EPSG 3857 as you remembered and the GPS coordinates EPSG 4326, you know, and these two uh, coordinate reference systems are critically important uh, for our uh, ecological research work. In most cases, we need to convert 3857 to 4326 and we're going to cover more detail in this lecture too. And then we talked very briefly about grid cells and we're going to talk more detail about the grid cells and random solutions of grid cells. We covered very briefly about random solution of grid cells. Uh, we're going to talk more detail about the random selections of the grid cells in this lecture and then converting EPAG 3857 coordinate reference into CSV. In this lecture, we're going to convert EPAG 3857 to 4326 and then convert it to CSV file for our um, ecological research uh, to, to go ahead. Uh, so these are the uh, these are the points we covered in lecture one. So let's, let's get dive into the lecture two. Um, so we, um, we're going to talk a lot about uh, the wildlife science to start with and then we talk about the, the implications of the wildlife science into QGIS and the utilizations and the QGIS is such a powerful tool for a wildlife ecological research work. Here you can see a Bengal tiger in the Sindhavan mangrove ecosystems. Um, this is the tigers, uh, dwindling numbers of tigers uh, in, in Bangladesh part of Sindhavans, nearly less than roughly 200 tigers left in the Bangladesh part of Sindhavans. So there used to be like uh, 10,000 tigers thriving back in the 1800s thanks to colonialism uh, in the British colonial rule. So they, they, they introduced trophy hunters and uh, they introduced guns and ammunition and killed the majority of the tigers, roughly 95% of the tigers uh, decimated and, and diminished uh, from this in the vast part of Bangladesh from, 18, uh, from 1800 to 1947, so over roughly around 200 years time frame. Um, so as you can appreciate that there's less than 200 tigers left in Bangladesh, we need to do something to help protect these tigers. Tigers are charismatic, enigmatic and um, you know a flagship key estimate species. If you save tigers, you're saving the whole ecosystems and the ecosystems um, in, in turn help uh, the whole uh, human uh, you know, uh, livelihood and the humanities uh, to go ahead and to survive and the biodiversity itself is so important for our human life that we can't really um, you know uh, go ahead with doing the corporate corporate levels work and, and thinking that that biodiversity is some kind of a you know, tertiary level things um, these these are old school thought you know so we are living in an era that we need to uh, make sure that the, the ecologically species the gift species have been uh, saved and safeguard so we can talk a lot more about this to start with and then we go ahead how we can actually save the species statistically speaking and that's where the QGIS comes in so obviously um, this is lecture two QGIS with ecological sampling methods you know so um, so in order to start the process as I mentioned to you before that wildlife science we're gonna start with the wildlife science and wildlife ecology and then we go ahead uh, with the wildlife science um, related matters um, uh, in relation to the QGIS based sampling method or statistically weighted QGIS, Q, statistically valid QGIS based sampling method. Uh, so what, what is wildlife science? Wildlife science, also known as wildlife ecology, is a branch of ecology. And ecology is a branch of biology itself that deals with fundamental questions of pertaining to species distribution and demography parameters. So when we're talking about species, you know, we don't know where the species live, how they live, uh, what they do, how they breed, and, and, and these questions come under uh, populations, you know, so we're talking about how the numbers are changing, uh, what we can do to save those numbers, and uh, where the numbers are actually increasing or decreasing. So these questions can be asked um, under the rubric of statistically valid sampling method. So that's why wildlife science is very much in tune to statistically valid sampling method uh, to develop and, and, and do the research in that direction. So it's basically more or less a mathematically driven subject, an you know, interdisciplinary mathematically driven subject. Okay. Um, so the more um, the more wildlife scientists know 
how species are distributed both spatially, you know, so we're talking about habitat, you know, spatially means space, so we're talking about habitat, and temporally means time sequences, uh, how uh, the species are actually distributed over time, and how the, the numbers of the population distributions is changing over time, so this is temporary. The better they are to devise science-based conservation plan to help protect species and its ecosystems. So we are talking about, you know, the species distribution, if we are talking about tigers in Bangladesh in the balance ecosystems, we are talking about how the distribution of the tigers are actually uh, you know uh, laid out in that particular ecosystems and how the numbers are changing over time so these are the two fundamental things that we need to take into account and um, you know implement on the QGS um, and, you know sampling method systems you know random sampling statistically very random sampling method uh, so these are the crux of the whole lecture too so let's look into uh, the second slide um, so obviously um, we are uh, wildlife ecologists or aka wildlife biologists bear in mind wildlife ecologists wildlife scientists wildlife biology are all um, the same subject you know we are dealing with fundamental questions how this species are distributed and how we can actually um, you know understand the population distribution pattern uh, especially and temporarily okay so the wildlife ecologists often needed to answer a few basic questions outlined below okay so these are the questions that wildlife scientists need to answer before we can actually um, go ahead and devise any conservation management plan uh, the first question here is how a species population is distributed in its habitat. So, uh, so when you're talking about Bengal tiger, as an example, in Bangladesh, in the balance, we need to know how this tiger is actually distributed in its habitat. You know, we do not know uh, where the tiger distribution is. Um, you know. Um, uh, is in a, a clustered manner or is in a sporadic manner or is it in like an equally distributed across the landscape so these are the questions that we need to answer so the first questions we need to deal with is basically how is species population how the tiger distribution is in its habitat ecosystems okay so uh, the second question is where in the ecosystem the species distribution is more sporadic and where the more uh, where where they're more clustered. So if species are not necessarily equally distributed across the landscapes. You know, in some places the species are more uh, phenomenal as opposed to some species in some spaces where they are not very common. So these are these are the, these are the root fundamental statistically valid sampling questions that we need to answer. So that's why I mentioned where in the ecosystem species distribution is more sporadic. You know, it's more random. Them, and where more is clustered is basically more species uh, you know the tigers are more found in certain spaces so in that way the conservation management plan comes into place we, we do not know the we do not know the answers of these questions we can't make a conservation management plan um, so where this population distribution is increasing and where they're decreasing you know this is another fundamental questions in terms of the conservation management plan to devise okay so at this point of time we do not know where the distribution of tigers is actually increasing is in the balance and where they're decreasing you know so these questions are comes under the statistically sampling method as i keep emphasizing the fact and uh, we need to do um, uh, a research survey, a field survey, uh, to find out the answers of these questions, and we're going to use the QGIS or the GIS-based any uh, software uh, to um, to devise a sampling method so that our sampling uh, method is not uh, uh, biased. Okay, uh, it, it remains unified, a conceptually unified, statistically valid sampling method. We're going to go ahead and look more details about these um, over the next uh, a few uh, slides. And what proportion of the species distributions are in fact uh, comes under protected areas? So you know the protected areas, right? Um, all countries more or less has uh, you know um, adopted or ratified um, the biodiversity con convention on biological diversities, where uh, certain parts of the ecosystems have been protected. That basically means you can't go in there and do whatever you want to do, like trophy hunting, like the British colonial peoples has done in the past, or um, you, you can't go in there and and, and, and kill tigers. So we need to know what proportion of the species distributions are in fact comes under protein. This is critically important questions to answer. If the species are sporadic, and we find out that most of the species are actually outside the uh, outside the protected area, more clustered outside the protected area, then that protected area is actually null and void. Uh, that that protected area has not, actually not serving its purposes. So we need to increase that protected area. So these questions are fundamental to understand and answer um, in terms of the con conservation management plan. 
Um, so we're going to look ahead um, what standardized sampling procedures and method will best serve long term. Uh, when we're talking about long term, we're talking about five to ten years population monitoring for that species. So we are talking about you know um, we need to devise a, a standardized sampling based statistically conceptually defined standardized sampling method that we can that we can that we can adopt and and we can carry on for the next ten years uh, for collecting ecological data of tigers to find out the distribution patterns of the tigers and how the species is actually changing over time so that's temporal distributions um, so these are really uh, basic fundamental questions wildlife ecologists wildlife scientists wildlife biologists um, has to ponder and has to answer and these need to be answered under the umbrella or under the rubrics of um, statistical and mathematical algorithms that's why QGIS is crucially important so let's go ahead and say uh, let's look into the side uh, the third sl slides of our um uh, of our presentations here so uh, we are uh, here you can see the jaguars you know the jaguar is also living in mangroves and uh, all other ecosystems in southern south america and this the jaguars is a case with species as well you know this num their numbers are also decreasing um you know um, in, um, as much as tigers or um, or, or any other key species that lives around the tropical ecosystems uh, so uh, the fastest step to answer these questions deeply you know the questions we have asked before in our last slide um, so we are talking about the first step to answer this question deeply rooted in devising conceptual and different statistical sampling method. You know, so we can't really go in the forest and start counting the tigers or, or jaguars. Okay, so it has to be done in a statistically, mathematically rigorous and statistically, statistically and ecologically valid sampling method. Um, followed by its utilization and implementation by harnessing the power of GIS tools. Since QGIS and as GNU FOSS uh, is so important, critically important. Um, I mentioned about the GNU FOSS is basically a uh, GNU is a uh, is basically a um, you know a recursive. A recursive acronym that messing with GNU is not unique. So we are talking we, we here we are in a Linux operating systems, uh, and uh, you know in uh, QGIS comes under uh, comes under Linux very neatly and cleanly. Um, I'm, I'm not sure about Windows because I've never used Windows. Uh, so we're talking about free and open source software. QGIS is a free and open source software, and it has the power to do things like you go to a bar and you want to have a beer, and you can't get a beer free, right? So if you want to get expensive beer, you can't really get it free unless you know someone so it's like QGIS is a very expensive sophisticated software and you're getting it free so it's like I'm having a free beer so free and open source software which is uh, I always mention Rich Stallman who actually uh, the MIT PhD um, graduates and uh, he initiated the free and open source software uh, to make sure that people like us you know who can actually do a lot of scientific works without uh, getting um, charged uh, by a company like Windows or Mac um, so um, it's very important to understand the fact is basically QGIS is a free and open source software on the GNU license and um, you can um, install it in any software but I in any operating systems but I would particular emphasis you go and transfer yourself to Linux or Unix based operating system. Um, so we are talking about statistical, uh, statistical value sampling matters. Okay, uh, the two ground rules of wildlife ecology must need to be taken into consideration. You know, it's very important that you, this is this is the first part of the lecture. So we are talking about wildlife science and wildlife ecology. So there are a couple of ground rules that we need to figure it out before we go ahead and do the sampling based, um, you know, survey, um, uh, devising the sampling based survey under QGIS. Okay, uh, so let's look let's let, let's look at the ground rule one. Not all species contribute equally in their roles to govern and manage ecosystems, which humans depend on the livelihood and survival. So what it basically means, species are not democratic. Okay, so we're talking species in a very, um, very much in an autocratic manner. Okay, the species are not distributed equally in their ecosystems. You know, some species are, or majority of the species are clustered in an area where they have more resources to hunt and more resources to uh, prey on. Okay, um, therefore, it is very fundamentally very important to appreciate the fact. Uh, sorry about, um, sorry about these things keep popping up. Um, I'm just gonna kill that. Um, so we are talking about uh, their roles in the ecosystems is pretty much governed by the resource utilization patterns and how the resources are being utilized where they live. Um, so um, they are not necessarily democratic in terms of their distribution pattern. Okay, so in some areas they are more clustered, and some areas they are more sporadic, and some areas they are not present at all. So that we need to take into account when we are doing any kind of statistically related sampling survey. 
okay uh, so the ground rule 2 is also very important and we call it a bumper sticker these two ground rule you know will be um, you know threaded across the whole um, lectures uh, over the period of next few weeks okay so you got to make sure that you understand this ground rule 1 and ground rule 2 not all species are distributed equally across the landscapes as I mentioned okay um, so these two will be taken into account these two ground rules will be taken into account when we are making a statistically very sampling um, in a strategy so let's go ahead and look into our um, slide the next slide uh, here what I'm gonna do I'm just gonna um, uh, we're just gonna cancel that so that it doesn't come up you know it's causing a lot of issues sorry about that so therefore species that plays vital role in its ecosystem software and the primary focus of wildlife research given the resources funding manpower and other associated constraints okay so we need to figure out which species are actually more important to govern the ecosystems okay um, in the ecosystems not all species plays a vital role okay the, the the management of the ecosystems depends on certain species so we're talking about a species that uh, sits at the top of the food chains like apex ecosystems you know we're talking about apex carnivores as an example tigers or jaguars you know they're sitting at the top of the food chains here you can see uh, uh, jaguars uh, jaguars is actually a very good swimmer it's probably the the, the best swimmers in all you know in all the carnivores across um, you know felid gills you know we're talking about cats you know uh, and what we're talking about here is basically how we can save those species you know if we can save these species we are actually saving the whole ecosystems where they live so we're talking about not only all the species that lives under their ecosystems like you know we're talking about snakes we're talking about birds we're talking about uh, all other different carnivores uh, and omnivores and herbivores and those all species are preserved if you can only save jaguars or tigers as an example so that's very important it's a very wise decision to save a manager of fun to save certain species that will help ensure that the whole and the species has been survived. Um, so uh, these species are also known as keystone species. You know, they're talking about uh, the species we are talking about, like tigers or jaguars. You know, they are also known as umbrella species. So umbrella is a common sense intuitive, um, you know, term. So you know, if you hold an umbrella, it, it saves you. It saves not only your head; it saves all your body um, from the rainwater, uh, for example. So we're talking about saving species like tigers or jaguars or um, a leopard um, in certain specific ecosystems you know we are not only saving those species but we also saving the entire ecosystems in the entire biological diversity of that certain area um, so these that's why they are called amaryllis species the ecologically valid term is called keystone species okay so for example bengal tigers are some of the mangrove ecosystems florida panther everglades mangroves jaguars of ordinary delta ecosystems in south and south america and, and so on these species are keystone species so in terms of the fundings and the resources and the manpower so for managing the whole rubric of the, uh, the wildlife, wildlife scientific research we need to make sure that we prioritize what species we can so we can't really save all the species there's not much point saving all the species in the sibling sitting down uh, right across your uh, in the backyard like a crow or uh, uh, some jackdaw or, or some kind of a sparrow you don't really need to save those species at all because they are not as like I mentioned to you before they're not you know ecosystems is not democratic you know some certain species plays more roles as opposed to certain other species so people who make a human cry about saving dogs and cats uh, are not really scientists you know they're not wildlife scientists right <laughs> because they're making human cry about sentimental issues you know so we're not talking about sentimental issues here we're talking about scientifically valid way of making sure that we can preserve uh, the part of the earth that we need to save uh, because for our own survival So, um, protecting keystone species ensure almost automatic safeguard for all other species and associated biological diversity, as I mentioned to you just just right now. Um, so let's go ahead and look at you with ecological sampling method. Um, so statistically rich sampling method for keystone species survey. So a simple random sampling. We're gonna we're gonna go ahead and we do the simple random sampling, which is statistically rich sampling method for ecosystem based utilization under QGIS. Okay. Um, before carrying out field survey, wildlife well, sensors need to generate a set of sampling coordinates. Uh, 
Uh, so we're talking about longitude and latitude in decimal degrees that are conceptually unified and statistically valid. Hence, for example, simple random sampling method. The utilization of the method will ensure no uh, man-made biases are introduced on during uh, data collections. Okay, so what we're talking here is basically uh, we're talking about you know um, statistically valid uh, random methods. You know, so we can't really go to the forest and start uh, counting tigers uh, wherever we want to go. Uh, it has to be done randomly so that no biases have been introduced. Okay, this is fundamentally, crucially, very important things to do. And every um, spaces in the every every point in the in the earth has a la latitude and longitude. You know, it's called coordinate reference systems. Okay, and um, we need to figure out the coordinate random coordinate reference points, as I mentioned in lecture one, um, to do the survey accordingly. Okay, so we need to generate random sampling coordinate reference points uh, for our survey to carry out. Okay, we can't really go and uh, we, we have seen some tigers over there. We're gonna go and talk how the tigers there. This is not scientifically bound survey. And a lot of people who do this kind of survey uh, for public propaganda and political, um, you know, uh, uh, political leverages, but these are not be entertained under scientific rubric. So you got to make sure that you are doing the survey in the right way. You know, garbage in, garbage out. You remember that term in 1980s and 1990s? You know, when you, in computers you can put all kind of data and you will still produce some kind of numbers. Okay, and that number has no validity whatsoever. You have to produce a number that is actually scientifically valid. Then it will give you the numbers that is correct. So the garbage in, garbage out. Okay, you, you, no data is better than, um, you know, uh, crap data. You know, that's very important. So ecologically sampling method is the first step and that's what we are covering in these lectures um, if you don't want to do any ecological sampling based method to do any kind of taking survey don't do any survey you know but don't go in the forest and try to uh, count tigers and according to your own ad hoc based uh, survey method because it not be entertained in scientific rubric uh, so let's go ahead and look into the remaining part of this lecture. We'll focus on QGIS practical. Okay, so these um, the first slide, you know, the first few slides I have covered here is basically covering the how we can actually, um, you know, how wildlife science is related with QGIS to begin with, and the sampling method, you know, the how the sampling methods is related with QGIS and the implementations of the sampling methods. We're gonna go ahead and look into the QGIS systems now. But as I mentioned, the ground rule one and ground rule two will be very neatly. Uh, you know um, incorporated in the QGIS systems and so it is very fundamentally important that if you don't have any understandings of wildlife science and wildlife ecology or wildlife biology um, and how the species are distributed the distribution patterns and, and what questions wildlife scientists are actually asking then you, there's no need for you to go ahead and do QGIS related research that's why I figured that for the first few slides I'm gonna go ahead and uh, go look uh, you know give you some brief information about wildlife science and wildlife ecology um, so let's go ahead and um, do um, um, start with our uh, QGIS practical now. So this is the Bengal tigers. So this number mangrove ecosystem. The mangroves are um, you know a new metaphor based root ecosystems. You know it's so basically all the roots are actually um, not going downwards. It's going upward. As you can see, all these roots around here, um, these are actually going upward, and we call them new metaphors. Um, because they uh, this extract nitrogen and phosphorus and um, carbons uh, from the air as opposed to from the soil. Um, and this is a very intricately um, uh, related uh, with all other uh, ecosystems, you know, in terms of their roles in uh, carbon sequestrations and all other factors. Um, so it is very important that we can say mangroves and uh, tigers is plays a vital role in mangroves and it's in the bounds because if we save tigers, you're actually saving the whole mangrove ecosystems. And, and and more importantly, is that it's, it's only the Bangladesh tiger, Bangladesh part of the tiger, the Bangladesh part of the mangroves of the bonds where tigers live. So there is no other mangroves in any other parts of the world where you can see where you can see tigers. Like Indonesia, has a lot of mangroves. And actually, there are the more mangroves in Indonesia and Malaysia as opposed to Bangladesh. As an example, Bangladesh is the largest mangrove ecosystems. But when it comes to collectively speaking, looking at uh, the uh, mangroves uh, in, in other parts of uh, Indonesia and Malaysia, they have more mangroves ecosystems there as opposed to Bangladesh but there's no tigers there right so we're talking about a specific ecosystems that has tigers and also the mangroves and Bangladesh is one that unique ecosystems uh, that we need to uh, look into here we're gonna talk about you know QGS practical of course in a QGS ecological sampling method okay here um, we the goal of this is basically the goal of this practical is to create random sampling points for carrying out ecological field survey 
focusing Bengal tigers, KSR species of Bengal national demands. Uh, collecting Bellary, uh, collecting Bellary ecological data on the tiger population distribution will help enable wildlife scientists to answer the questions we have discussed in previous slides. The data will also serve as benchmark to devise long term conservation monitoring of Bengal tigers in the land, land, land escapes. So what what we what we're talking here is basically we need to understand how the tigers have been distributed in Bengal in the most part. And we can only do this survey by creating a random sampling point survey. Um, and we're going to use the QGIS as a resource tool to um, uh, make sure that we create random sampling points where we can go and, and do the survey um, um, in the field, right? Um, so QGIS practical is ecological sampling, ecological sampling method, um, you know, focusing on the Bengal tigers and Sundarbans mangroves in Bangladesh. So here you can see th th there's a couple of tigers in here. One of the tigers is actually radio tagged. As you can see, it's the objective for QGS practical. Here we're gonna um, look, uh, we're gonna raster map of Bangladesh in the one. So the first thing we're gonna do is basically uh, we're gonna load raster map of Bangladesh in the bus, or Bengal tiger habitat. So what I plan to do now is basically uh, we're gonna minimize these screens and we're gonna go ahead and, and, and do start doing the QGS practical work. Okay, so let me just minimize that screen. Here you can see um, I'm using Linux, a DBL Linux operating system, of course. And um, what we'll do now here, we're gonna load the latest version of QGIS. So I'm gonna type QGIS in here and then press enter. And that will load QGIS 3.4, which is the latest version of QGIS. So <laughs> the QGIS has been loaded. Um, so uh, we mentioned about here the raster map of Bangladesh in the bounds of Bengal tiger habitat. Okay. So the first thing we're gonna do now is basically we're gonna go to Quick Map Service, and then we're gonna go to Google, and then go to Google Hybrid, and we're gonna go straight to Bangladesh. Okay. So Bangladesh is near to India. It's in the eastern part of um, um, India. It's not part of India. I mean, it's an independent country. It used to be a part of India a long time, but now it's an independent country. It's been independent from 1970, um, as far as I remember. So we go to Bangladesh, as you can see, and then we go to Sundarbans. As you can see, Sundarbans is already coming up here. Here, I can see in the one forest. Okay. So, what we do here is basically in QGIS, you need to have a good internet connectivity to do this kind of work. So, if you don't really have a good internet connectivity, it's gonna be really hard for you to load up QGIS map. Yeah, so what I'm doing here is minimizing the screen in such a way so that you can you can see me here as well as I'm giving you the lecture. Um, so this is the this is in the bounds, okay? This is in the bounds. This Sindhaban National Park is actually the Indian part of uh, Sindhabans and it's roughly 4,000 uh, kilometers and then you have the largest part in Bangladesh Park which is roughly 6,000 kilometers. Altogether it's roughly 10,017 square kilometer which is uh, two times bigger than the state of Delaware and probably 25 times bigger than Hong Kong. Uh, so you're talking about a large ecosystem here. So this needs to be taken into account that we're talking about a large ecosystem here. Okay, we're not talk talking about small little ecosystems um, in some part of um, you know um, uh, islands or something. Okay, um, so th th this is a huge ecosystem. You know, this this is like uh, three hundred times bigger than Singapore, as an example. Um, so where the tiger sleeps, you know, we do not know. Um, so the, the whole point of this uh, practical is basically to create a sampling based 
um, coordinate systems uh, so that we can um, have specific coordinate points where we can actually go into the bus and do our survey work okay so that's the whole objective of this whole lectures okay so as you can see in QGIS if you press control and the scroll your mouse up and it will blow up the screen and if you scroll down the mouse then you will go down so here we, we adjust it accordingly so we're talking about the Bangladesh products and the bounce and that's where this is the you know that's where we're gonna do our work uh, practical work okay so let's go back to our slide so this is raster map of Bangladesh and the bounce Bengal tiger habitat okay so this is a raster map under QGIS okay um, here um, let's have a look into the second point here's the vector map of the shape file of the bounds so what we'll do now here is basically we're gonna overlay uh, the shape file of the of the cinema so we got we, we talked a vector file uh, you know lecture one and so obviously you have some ideas about what we're talking here um, so let's go ahead and the shape files and vector files you can you can google it you got you can type shape file so in the bounds that you will uh, it will give you some links to download your shape file it's basically a polygon geometric file um, we show um, the you know the the, the perimeters uh, of the Sundarbans and it's very important because a lot of research you don't really need all these details like Sundarban Forest of Bangladesh and you have Tinkona Island here uh, you know Kalicha, Dubla Chor uh, and the Thayat Chor and we don't really need all this um, information so sometimes it's very important for our mathematical algorithm to develop to do the modeling work of species distributions to only work with um, the shape file and so what we're gonna do we're gonna overlay or uh, superimpose you know that's probably the um, you know a more sophisticated word to use here um, um, to you um, in our Google hybrid map here right okay so we're gonna go to layer and add layer and then add vector layer because all shape files all polygon files are actually vector files or vector map um, so we're gonna go these three ellipses in here uh, keep it on UGF8 and keep it in file and then we, uh, we click that uh, three ellipses in here and then we go to bushcat uh, which is one of my folder here and then we're gonna go gis and gis data and the vector data and this shape files in the bounds so here we're gonna our file extension would be um, esri shape file okay so always make sure that is um, environmental science research institute share files okay yes all right share files um, we're gonna choose in the last 2015 so it's relatively um, you know um, a new share file so it will very neatly superimpose with our um, in a satellite um, in a satellite um, remote sensedly you know remote remotely sensed map of in the bounds as you can see under Google um, so it has been nicely actually um, done and is thin line so what we can do um, now I'm just gonna adjust it in such a way so that you know it looks a lot better here right okay so what we plan to do now is basically we have overlay this in the bounds shape file and um, what I'm going to do now is basically go to properties and then I'm going to change it to a different color of the shape lines you know the polygon lines so that it looks more visible okay as you can see it looks a lot more visible can you see um, what's going on here
so the shape file has been nice and superimposed okay so if we get rid of that then you can see this in the bounds in shape file format that's the shape file is in the bounds and we can superimpose or overlay uh, the Google hybrid remotely sensed uh, map on on top of the on top of our shape file we can get rid of the shape file we can get rid of everything as a blank screen okay so here we go shape file that's the power of QGIS you know you can overlay thousands of things on top of everything um, so here we have the shape file and the cinema file so far so good right so let's go back to the lecture and so so we have raster map of Bangladesh in the bounds and then we have vector map shape files in the bounds let's go ahead and see to create an overlay appropriate grid cells okay also known as grid blocks in our raster and vector map so what we plan to do now here is basically we're gonna create a well now what we're gonna do is basically we're gonna create a grid cells um, on, uh, or, or, and overlaying it in our vector and raster map okay raster map is basically Google hybrid map that's what we're working on here okay so the first thing we're gonna go we're gonna go to vector and we're gonna research tools okay and then we're gonna go to create grid can you see here create grid and then once we get there we make sure from there we choose rectangle polygon okay and the grid extends we click that ellipsis this three dot is called ellipsis so we click that and then we use layer extent okay use the make sure that you use layer extent and then it's just in the bounds you know this is the file this is the vector file you know so we're gonna overlay our grid cells on top of our vector files that we have loaded before okay not the google hybrid don't do that in google hybrid map okay so it has to be something about 2015 um, you know so you need to really download your vector file or the shape file okay and you can get it free uh, if you just uh, google it and if you're clever you will know how to do it okay so this is not part of this lecture so you, you can you can find shape files from anywhere if you're clever so um so soon about that i'm not going to go into show you how to find the shape file you're going to go and do your research on that so Sundaman 2015 EPSG 34326 so we're gonna we're gonna okay that and then this is very important you know is can you see these horizontal spacing vertical spacing so we're talking about a vector grid blocks so the it's all in the meters so the balance is 6,070 square kilometer okay so you need to be mathematically intuitive to figure out if you put only one meters it will create a very clustered dense um, you know the blocks and we don't want that okay so we need to change that so let's say 5000 meters that's really five five kilometers okay five one thousand meters is one kilometer so five thousand meters is five kilometer and that's fair enough okay because it's in the much is a large ecosystem so we need a large blocks uh, you know large blocks for doing survey so five thousand five square kilometers so we're gonna do the survey for five square kilometers that will create a decent block of grids um to overlay okay so it's very important that it's all in the meters not in the degrees there's a lot of degrees in here um and miles and years and feet and kilometers but you're choosing meters okay um so we're choosing meters so five thousand meters is five five kilometer sorry five thousand meters is um, five thousand meters is um 1000 meter 1000 meter is one kilometer so we're talking about five kilometer here okay um so make sure that you know you know your units okay it's very very important that you know your units so if you're doing in meters so you make sure that 1000 meters is one kilometer therefore 5000 meters is five kilometers so it's the block is five square kilometer block okay and we're gonna say that so you make sure that in then the grid here you can see the grid so you click that ellipsis button here you make sure that it's safe to file you really need to make sure they safe to files okay so i have saved it on shp file which is shape files and then make you make sure that you choose the right uh, you know the, the name for the for the shape file in our case we're gonna put down <coughs> cinnamon's grid that makes sense right okay and um, and then save it okay and then just run it just click run 
and once you run it and if you close it then you can see the grid box is nicely and neatly done and if you take the Google hybrid map you can see it is very nicely neatly overlaid you know some the one share file okay it's very neatly overlaid you know also in the mass share file so here we have the five square kilometer grid block I'm really sorry about this um, this lectures you know this the screens keep getting bigger and thinner as as we work on and this is not something that I can control This will resolve the problem. right okay so we have this um, yeah okay so we have these uh, grid blocks in here so far um, so what we're going to do is basically uh, we're going to go back to the lectures and since to, to randomly select a set of grid cells on a simple random sampling okay to create an overlay appropriate grid cells so we, we've done that to create an overlay appropriate grid cells okay aka grid blocks in our register and, uh, and vector map so we have done that in here so we have done we have done that in here so what i'm going to do to randomly select a set of grid cells okay uh, so first hour for sampling strategy and a simple random sampling okay so here what we plan to do is basically we're gonna go back to vector again we go to research tools and random sampling random selections okay and the grid um, we actually what we're going to do is basically we, we do, we're going to get rid of that you can get rid of this grid first and we're gonna layer add layer because we saved that vector layer before you know as a random block and we're gonna find that out and we're gonna go back to right folder to find it okay GS practical cinema grid did you remember we saved that as number grid and then we put back in here okay so as you can see our grid block is here and then we go vector we're gonna randomly select a certain proportion of the blocks that we need to do our survey so we go to vector again research tools and then random selection under random selections as you can see that Sindhavan's grid is already been loaded up. That's the one that we want. And percentage, you know, number of selected features, or we can choose percentage of selected features. We cannot click percentage of selected person, and then we choose ten percent. As an example, ten percent. Okay, ten percent is good enough, you know, because ecologically, because of the manpower constraint and all kind of survey related issues, technical issues, topographical issues, you know, uh, technical issues, um, and all kind of socio political issues, you can't really do a lot of survey in a lot of places. But it doesn't necessarily mean that your survey will be compromised. It just basically means 
even if you have a, a small uh, data, uh, a valid ecologically, uh, statistically valid ecological data, small um, uh, proportion of the area, that will provide a more better understanding than as opposed to doing a haphazard survey of a lot of areas without having any statistical underpinning. Uh, so it's important. So let's just start with 10%, okay? And just keep running it, okay? And uh, as you can see here, what happened is basically, 10% of the area has been uh, randomly selected. As you can see, it's been randomly selected. And you can see it better if I get rid of all that. And you can see it here. 10% of the whole block has been randomly selected. Okay. Um, so what we plan to do now is basically we're going to save these random blocks. It's very important that we save this random So we cinema's grid. Okay. Right click it. Go to properties. Sorry, um, before we go to properties, we suppose you right click it and then go to export and save feature as. And then once you come here, make sure that you uncheck that, add save file to map, uncheck that, save only selected features. Okay, make sure that you click that. Okay, and you click a file name, make, make a file name and save it in the right directory. So here in that case, it's GIS practical. And it has to be ESRI shapefile, and we're gonna save it as Sundarbans Random. Okay, Sundarbans Random, and save it there, like just like that. And then UTF-8 is fine. Just like I mentioned, you just make sure to save all these selected features. Okay, you check that on, and then everything is fine so you save that okay as you can see layer exported it's saying successfully saved vector layer once that get done we don't particularly need that anymore so we remove that remove this layer and now what we're gonna do we're gonna add our new layer that we have saved we're gonna add we're gonna go to layer add layer add vector layer and then we go straight to the one that we have saved Okay, so the most random. Did you remember? That's the way we saved it. And add that and close it. As you can see, these are the 10% of the layers that this is the first tire of our sampling survey. Okay. We go back to the lecture so as you can see to randomly select a set of grid cells, first tire of our sampling strategy and a simple random sampling. It's very important that what we have done so far okay to understand so we go back to the add layer add vector layer and then we go back to Sundarbans grid and we open the Sundarbans grid again okay so let's have a look what we have done so far okay okay the first thing we have done is very important guys that you understand what we have done so far um, so we have loaded from the quick map service Sundarbans raster map okay and then we have added an overlay or superimposed Sundarbans shapefile okay that's our Sundarbans shapefile that's our vector map sorry that's our raster map okay that's a raster quick map service a base map uh, also called the base map so we have loaded base map first and then we have loaded the vector map, a shape file. Okay, can you see? That's a shape file. That's a vector map. Okay, that's a shape file. That's a vector map. Uh, sorry, raster map. Okay, quick map service, rest, uh, quick map service, raster map. Okay, so you have the raster map, and then you have the shape file, the vector map overlay, and then we have created a grids. Okay, so that's our Sundarbans grid. Did you remember? And then we have created random selection of ten percent of the Sundarbans grid, and those are the grid. Can you see that? These are the ten percent of the grid, and we can get rid of that, the total grid. So these are the grids that we have created. As you can see from here, that uh, some of the grids are actually outside of the Sundarbans, and we don't particularly need that. 
but there's no way we can delete that because it's randomly selected um, so when we do our um, uh, the coordinate uh, you know the, the, the second tire of our survey method we will make sure that we match up and um, accordingly exclude those areas that are not part of the but this is manually uh, leg work but it's not necessarily bad work to do uh, be most of mo most of the grid blocks so these would be the grid blocks inside the cinder box that would be our survey points okay so we need to figure out because this is square points so five square kilometers square points but we can't really know where exactly we can start our survey so if you're doing a cinder survey in terms of distance sampling if you're doing a distance sampling of like one square kilometer one kilometer straight ahead to do a distance sampling of uh, of for tigers then that's one thing but if you're going spot and and looking into tiger dung or or anything to do with tiger ti tiger signs and so on then we still need to find other points so we do not know exactly which points we, we we can actually start with so that that has to be done randomly as well so this is the second tire of the simple random sampling so first tire was basically randomly selected all these blocks and the second tire of this would be to randomly select a point within these uh, randomly selected blocks where we gonna go and st actually start doing our field survey okay so to do that uh, so let's just leave, leave it the way it is. Let's just go back to the lectures and see what it says in here. To assign set of coordinate points, latitude and longitude in decimal degrees. Okay, it's very important that it's not in degree, minutes, and seconds. Okay, because when you use the GPS systems, the GPS systems will always use the decimal degrees and it usually come with EPSG 4326 and we're going to talk a little bit about it a little later okay I know this lecture is going to be a long lectures but lectures are usually one hour lectures okay so I'll try to make sure that all things has been finished up within an hour and so far we have covered roughly at half an hour of lecture so far okay so it's very important that you need to make sure that latitude and longitude is in decimal degrees um, thankfully the QGIS you know the QGIS EPSG 4326 comes under decimal degrees so we don't really need to worry too too much about it but I'll show you what exactly need to be done formally uh, so to assign set of coordinate points so within our randomly selected grid cells okay second tier for sample random something so this what I talked about very briefly um, about uh, in here that what what points we need to actually uh, fill in here um, so uh, what I plan to do here is basically all this randomly selected uh, blocks we gonna randomly um, select a point uh, coordinate points okay so what we're gonna do now we're gonna go back to the vector again and then we're gonna go research tools and here random points in layer bounds you know this is the not random points in extend random points inside polygons you know don't get confused with that uh, so you're gonna use the random points in layer bounds click that and here it's in the one grid We can change it to something that's random. Okay. Make sure that you change it to something that's random. Okay. Not something that's greed. Because we don't want something that's greed. Because that was only the greed. But something that's random is the random cells. So the 10% of our cells. So to make sure that you choose something that's random. A number of points. Let's say we want two points in each block. You know, our each each random cells. Okay. So we can choose two. Uh, no, no, no. Sorry. What I'm talking here is basically you see the each cells randomly selected. In each cells, there will be points, but these points will be proportionally distributed across the landscapes. Okay. So it's very important how many points of survey you want to do. Okay. Considering a map so this is ecologically instinctive judgment. Okay, so you got to be sure that you have the resources and in terms of the funding, you have the resources map in terms of the um, people who are actually gonna go ahead and collecting data for tigers over there. So if you have ten people, so you got to make sure uh, how you can actually do, um, you know, how how you can actually manage your manpower to do. Uh, with the 10 people to do the surveys in this particular area uh, with certain blocks you know we, we have chosen a lot of blocks you know 10 percent is is not a matter of joke you know so we have a lot of blocks here let's have a look how many blocks we got there if you look into the blocks we have roughly over 20 blocks around here in some cinema so we're talking about people you know we're talking a lot of people to go in there do the research and also the fundings you know it's not 
you know it's not easy so these are the judgment calls and a professional ecologist you know ecologist with a proper solid ecological background probably with a master's or PhD degree will able to make a judgment so here let's say I'm gonna make a decision of no more than 25 okay as a ground rule you can say 25 um, uh, points points basically mean coordinate reference points okay this is the point where you're gonna start off with this is the final guys you gotta make sure that you understand what I'm talking here okay so these are the 25 points where our final survey points will be you know we're gonna go ahead there in this is the most mangrove ecosystems and exactly where there the coordinate references and we're gonna start our survey it could be point survey it could be a line tensor survey it could be distance sampling survey it could be a camera photo capture uh, ca capture recapture modeling survey whatever you know it's up to you we're gonna cover all that in lecture three and lecture four but at this point of time it's very important we choose the right number of points okay so let's say we choose number 25 okay and the minimum distance is between points and this is also important we don't want the points to be clustered around you know we just we don't want point two points like like this okay um, because we know Sindhu is a large ecosystem 6017 square kilometer we know we are talking about meters so what we'll do we we'll make a half kilometer distances between two points so it's 500 meters that's half kilometers 1000 meters is one kilometer 500 meters makes half kilometer so we make it half and then random points so we're gonna save these random points we click that ellipsis and we go to save to file and then we're gonna make as random points that's our shape file as well random points save it and we, we don't particularly need to open it so we just uncheck that and then run it so that's been run and that's been done okay so what we can do now we can uncheck that and then add that layer we just saved random points as vector layer so this all shape file shp file is vector file okay it's a polygon file it's a point file and 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 that's what we are doing here so what we're gonna go we're gonna go back and we're gonna find random points that's random points open that and add it and those points are added as you can see we we have chosen roughly 25 points all these 25 points has been chosen and been nicely delineated in our vector and raster map but these points are not big and these are not necessarily visible so what we what we can do and as you can see in here all these points are layer bounds so all these points are inside of our selected polygons okay and it's also and this is the second tire of a random sampling can you see how it worked out we have randomly selected um, you know a certain amount of blocks certain amount of cells and then we have randomly selected um, certain points you know with a uh, with an assigned number of points okay in that cases we have created 25 points okay but these are all randomly selected under the random selections of the um, cells so these are two tired things so let's go back to the lectures again and have a look to assign set of coordinate points latitude and longitude in decimal degrees we did not randomly selected grid cells that's what your second tire of a sample run or something so this is very important this is very very important as we done that that actually eliminate all kind of biases that can that can be introduced here okay so what we're gonna do we're gonna make it we're gonna right click the random points we go to the properties we we'll make it more visible in terms of the color color so simple marker we click the simple marker in here and then from here we're gonna choose color let's say red visible and that is dot we can change that size from two to different size okay so make it a little bit bigger let's say three that's big enough and then click apply and and you can see better now can you see that as you can see some of these points are outsiders in the bounds and these these as i mentioned to you before these need to be uh, manually eliminated from our survey work but this is not part of our uh, lecture two uh, and we're not going to go details about it but majority of them i would say roughly around 75 percent of them are inside these are the pure um, survey point uh, i can see these two points kind of overlapped uh, but that's fine you know it doesn't really matter you can 
class two of them in the same or maybe you can do survey two because Sonoma is such a large landscape you know even 500 meters or a half a kilometer you will show in the map as like kind of clustered and that's what happened here uh, but other than that most of them most of them are like very neatly uh, delineated so these random points are actually proper sampling points okay um, so let's go back to the lecture now and see what it says finally to generate data file in csv you know comma separated value format for a random selected coordinate point so we have we have created a random selected points in here okay um the lecture is almost one hour you know this lecture is almost one hour just check the time so i'm gonna be very careful now in terms of the time i don't want lectures too long so in here so what we're gonna do now is basically we're gonna create um uh, csv a comma separated values we need to know uh, this is very important guys you know in here we need to know uh, the coordinate reference point so that we can go to the field survey and do the field survey in there okay so for that we need to know the coordinate reference of this at, at this point of time it is in epsg 3857 can you see here epsg 3857 and that's not what we want we want because we want to use a gps system we're going to use a gps system these are in epsg 43206 you know it's a google 43206 so when you go in there the coordinate reference point which we talked a very briefly about in lecture one what coordinate reference system is but for now we're not going to go into geography we're not talking about geographic information science we're not going to go all the details about it okay so what i'm going to very briefly cover here is basically converting all our coordinate points here at this point of time the coordinate points in here can you see the coordinate points in here all these coordinate points in a latitude longitude in the first and latitude second okay and here for example this one i can see nine nine two seven eight nine and then two four and this is in epsg three eight five seven but we don't want that so we what we're gonna do we're gonna save all these sampling points under comma separated value format in EPSG 4326 and it's very simple to do it in QGIS 3.4 and I'm talking about QGIS 3.4 okay I'm not talking about other versions so you got to be careful in terms of what versions of QGIS you're using if you're using older versions don't hold me back okay because this is this is completely different versions of QGIS okay this is the upper you know very good versions you know very latest versions of QGIS and it is longer job than the previous versions was doing absolutely nothing okay so I'm not going to using all the older versions for doing this kind of work okay so you make sure that you install the QGIS 3.4 uh, other than that it gonna be really this this lecture is going to be very con contradictory if you're using QGIS 1.8 or 2.4 okay so you gotta make sure that you're using the right version so here I'm using QGIS 3.4 so for now okay so these points need to be saved under comma separated values so we got the random points so we, we click uh, we click random points we click right and then we go export can you see there are export versions here and the save feature as once we go there is pop up window here and make sure the first thing is very careful what you do here you know we don't want CSRI ESR file we we're gonna go back to CSV files so we're gonna choose comma separated values of CSV can you see that the file that's for the first things and the file name before you choose the file name you go back GIS practical okay the right folder and then choose the file name this is sampling coordinates right also can you see how i'm typing these things this is called camel type because the camel has a hump and this is the way the programmers work okay so you have first hump as a cap s and the second hump okay it's called camel typing it's very important the way you type it you know so that you know it's standardized for all other people to understand anyone who do programming languages in python or c programming languages they will understand this camel type writing and so you save the files in a certain format and certain style that other people can understand you just didn't type it the way you want to type it other people who didn't understand that so it's a camel type sampling coordinates okay csv file save it and then here is very important this this portion is very very important how we do it okay so here we're gonna scroll down a bit and can you see the geometry type is not automatic it's gonna be point you choose point okay and then you scroll down a little bit more 
and under layer options can you see the geometry i'm told i told you before gis is qgis is not a soft learning curve you know it's a steep learning curve so here these little things need to be very very careful if you make one mistake you will not produce the result that you want okay so you, you got to be very careful what you're doing here so the geometry drive as i mentioned to you that in here longitude first and latitude second and in Cartesian coordinate systems, we have x axis and y axis. Okay, so in the geometry type, we gotta make sure that we have the x axis and the y axis. Okay, and the x axis here is our lat longitude, and y axis is our latitude. Okay, as simple as that, and that's exactly QGIS is registered as. So we're gonna open that and we're gonna choose x, y. Can you see that? that basically ensure the longitude is comes first and latitude comes second so, so x axis is our longitude y axis is our latitude okay in cartesian coordinate reference systems okay so geometry you must make sure that you choose as x y okay and then go down a little bit data sources these are not very important so you just leave it leave it blank for now so yes x y so the most important thing we geometry type is point make sure that id is chosen i'll show you what id means basically the numbers you know we have like 25 sampling point and these all be numbered with zero is the first number and then so you will come with 24 you know zero plus 24 is 25 right uh, well in <laughs> in, uh, in computer languages um, so zero is class as one okay so 24 plus 1 is 25 uh, okay so the id is very important utf8 ephd 38 this is what we're gonna change this is very very important okay so this coordinate reference system or crs we don't want as 3857 like i said to you before when you go to the site to do a survey you know when you go to the field it will be on a gps uh, device and the gps device is off almost all the gps devices coded reference system is 4326 you know ephg 4326 so what we will do we'll change it to ephg 432 can you see default crs ephg 4326 we just choose that and good thing is pgs will, is already will do it for you so you just gonna click default crs epg 4326 okay this is the number for the coordinate reference systems very very but that's why i covered it last okay so it goes into your brain so it's very important that you crs epg 4326 okay so what we have done we have done format csv we have chosen the right directory and the file name in a camel type we have changed the CR system from EPHG 3827 to uh, 3857 to 4326 and then we gone we scroll down a bit and then we have changed the geometry drive to X Y X X is longitude first and latitude second and also we have geometry type point okay which is our point coordinates okay once we get all that done and if very careful that you do all that you take your time but make sure that you do it that's why this lecture is taking time because i am taking time to let you know how it need to be get done if you make one mistakes the result will be absolutely null and void and you will be going to stack uh, you know exchange and stack uh, what do you call it you know um yeah stack change right you know and there's stack overflow you can go in there and writing and typing to people and you go to free known irc and people in qgs do nothing you know sit down there like ooh, ooh, sleeping and then 25 years later you might get some response so it's very important that what i'm showing you you know you get in your head um so and, and then press okay and you are more or less done so your sampling coordinates has been created and successfully it says layer is supported successfully vector layer okay it's already you know it's already popping up in here but you know so you can remove that from here you don't need that here okay um so you, you are more or less done now okay you are more or less done so what let's go back to the issues now okay so finally to generate uh, data file in csv so let's just load um, the G, you know, the CSV file that we have created, okay. Let's just load the CSV file we have created. Uh, so we go back um, to uh, documents here, 15 weeks. Uh, so we go GIS and GIS practical and just did um, GIS, um, yeah, GIS, GIS, where, where you saved it.
the same written under uh, GS Practical. Okay, so here under GS Practical, you see the CSV file somewhere. Yeah, same thing code here CSV. Can you see here? And you open that. As you open it, as you can see, our x is the longitude and y is the latitude. And the serial number I mentioned to you before 0 to 24, it's basically 25. And the ID number is so important. And then you can do the pre processing the data in terms of you know, this is the latitude. Can you see the latitude and longitude is very different than the latitude and longitude we have in here? Can you see that? It's 99, it starts from 98, 99, and then 24. Because this is an EPHG 3857, we have transferred to 43, um, you know, uh, the other one, you know, the, the one that Google uses, you know, I can't remember the number. Let, let me just look at the number. It's called, yeah, 4326. EPHG 4326. Um, and uh, the number we have exchanged it. And you can see that the, the coordinates point is very different. These are the coordinate points. You can change that x to longitude now, you know, if you want to. And we can write down longitude. So that you can remember what's the, the last longitude and that's the latitude. So you got the latitude and longitude. The ID is not. You know, ID is not important, so you can transfer the ID. You can you can cut that, and then maybe you can insert in here. Um, Insert it here, so it makes more sense, right? So you got, and then you, you can also do something. You know, you can do all this data processing. You know, if if you're, you know, indeed, these are basic things that is school case now, right? So you, know, you can do all that and uh, make it more uh, presentable, so that you need that data because this is your final output of your sampling points, right? Um, so what we need to do to make it like this, and uh, we change the format. Base charter maybe twelve and uh, maybe center and then um, yeah so that looks a lot better right so you got the longitude and latitude in here okay and actually you can you can actually change you know this, so this is this is your you, this is your final results okay. It's very important. These are the survey points. These are the twenty-five survey points where you're gonna go and do your research. You know, they just do your surveys, okay? And some of the survey points that are outside, you know. So in order to change that, so you know, you are, you are at the moment you're in EPAG three eight five seven. So you can go ahead and change it to EPAG four three two six now if you want to. And it's important you can eliminate some of those um, that uh, WGS for eighty four four three two six. Can you see that? You change that to that. And apply that and that's changed so some of these one so let's say this one it says in here you know 89.260 and then 2252 you know the numbers you got there and then you can have a look in here the one that 260 okay Yeah, this one, 89.260, and this one. So this one, you don't need it. Can you see, because this one was outside, so you can delete that. So that way, um, as simple as that, okay? So that way, you can get rid of some of these points. So one, two, three points is outside. You know, four, five, five of these points, you know, that way manually, like I mentioned to you before, you know, you can manually uh, get rid of some of these points from there, um, and, um, and, and you are fine okay um so that's pretty much the lecture uh, of the lecture i know it was a big lecture so you can save this file as well use text csv format okay
okay this is very important this this data like i mentioned it, qgis is nothing but data driven so when you have the tiger distributions of these specific areas that you can plug these data on and then the map will show you where exactly the tigers are this is the whole point of doing the survey okay so so far so good okay so let's just get rid of everything from here so what we have done first is basically let's just uh, let's just go very quickly go ahead and look into what we have done so far in QGIS okay to recap the lectures okay to review the lectures so we have done the Google Sundarbans mangroves and then we have added the overlay the superimposed shape file and then we have done the Sundarbans grid and then we have Sundarbans random selections of the Sundarbans grid and those are the random points did you remember these are the random uh, random cells yeah so you have the random blocks and then the random cells okay here and then we have created those points under the this is two tire uh, random sampling in the simple random samplings okay so and the final result is such okay here as simple you can see the shape file is a lot more easy because you don't need the base map anymore so here you can do that that way or you can do that way okay you can see all these random points are under the you know under the random blocks we have chosen so these are the random blocks we have chosen and um, you know we have chosen we have, we have chosen these random blocks and then we have chosen these random points okay and then you can you can add the base map on top so these are the things that we have covered in our lecture too it was long lectures and i hope it helped you to understand from ecological point of view how to carry out the sampling based ecological survey uh, to be, you don't go to the forest and do a start surveying uh, it all depends on you know carrying out a sampling based ecological survey uh, method to establish before you can actually go to the forest and do the survey so these coordinates points are statistically valid and conceptually unified ecological sampling points for conducting field survey as to collect ecological data on Bengal tiger distributions to the world so which sampling points we are talking about these are the sampling obviously I mentioned some of the sampling points are outside of our survey area and that we need to get rid of but other than that majority of the sampling points are this these are the sampling points on lang language and language these are the final results of the sampling points right and, and these need to be saved under comma separated values and, and these are the areas that you plug into your gps systems to go in the forest and do your survey and the data file we have created as csv format can be loaded in gps devices as i mentioned to you and gps related necessary file format is usually gpx format we can then use our gps to locate our server points and syllabus ecosystems okay uh, let's go um to the final sections of the lecture 2 qgis based ecological sampling method and this is a linux you know this is a lynx you know it's a nice a pretty sweety cat um, expected learning outcomes from these lectures okay so theoretical understanding on few basic principles of wildlife science and wildlife ecology i hope i have given you some basic underpinnings of wildlife science and wildlife ecology and and its implementations under qgis statistically based sampling method of qgis um statistical sampling method simple random sampling we have used simple random sampling but bear in mind that simple random sampling that we have used is two tire one is basically first of all uh, laying out the grid cells and then randomly selected certain proportion of the grid cells in terms of percentage and then that's the first tire and then randomly uh, but assigned you know uh, selections of the random points okay but those random points are randomly selected under the random cells okay but you will assign how many cell points or how, how many coordinate points you want so in that cases we have chosen 25 coordinate points but these coordinate these 25 coordinate points are randomly um you know um, um randomly selected under the random cells so this is two tires and it's very very important that you do these two tires because that will eliminate all kind of human human or man-made biases in our ecological sampling survey and the QGS operations on the functions of the grid cells overlay um, we have done the you know the, the functionalities of the QGIS in terms of the grid cells overlay um, and random selections of the grid cells okay random points with random oscillatory grid cells 
um, overlaying all the randomly created coordinate points in our register and vector maps finally exporting and saving our sampling coordinates as csv files we have covered all of that um, so let's just have a quick look into again okay let, let, let's just do all that okay so the first thing here is mentioned is basically qgs operations on the functions of the grid cells overlay okay so here we have the grid cells okay that's the grid cells overlay random selection of the grid cells these are random selections of the grid cells okay overlaying all the random created coordinate points in a raster and vector layer the random points within random selected grid cells okay so let's go back random points these are the random points within the random grid cells okay so the random points within randomly selected grid cells overlaying all the randomly created coordinate points in raster vector maps so and that's what we can do and we have done that that's the base maps or the raster map and then here and we don't need the whole bag the grid cells map so we can get rid of that and that that shows the final results and actually you can get rid of that too and that, that shows you everything and if you want to be more careful then you can get rid of that and that will make a lot more sense or just get rid of that okay so these are the random points that we need to do the survey uh, for tiger distributions you cannot go into the certain part of the areas in the bonsai and start doing the surveys of tigers because you want to do um, that's not statistically valid sampling method um, so so that's that's the lecture too all together guys i hope you enjoyed and learned something from it and hopefully one day um, i'll see you in the months bye for now